Thank you, Katrina, for taking us through our kids' talk this morning. And I think we might have a front runner for our furthest away competition. Fiona is watching us from Plains in Airdrie, so welcome, Fiona. We're delighted that you've been able to join with us. How can the church stay relevant in a post-COVID world? Today is the first part in a three-part series we're going to be doing looking at this question. And we're going to start today by looking at, well, what actually is the church and what is its purpose? Next week, we're going to be looking a little bit more narrowly at what God has said to us as a church over the years and the kind of things that we've been called to and how is that relevant to us as in this season. So next week, we're going to be looking at the bird table, specifically looking at a lot of stuff around young people. And then on the 7th of February, we're going to be looking at what it is to be pioneers in this season. Now, at the start of this year, we are all fully aware that we've been thrown into this year with a lot more restrictions for the right reason. But unlike the first time, unlike 12 months ago, there's a big shining light at the end of the tunnel in the form of a vaccine. And I know some of you watching this will have already had the first dose, which is fantastic. But at some point in the very near future, we're going to emerge from the shadow of this dark period in our history, and we'll enter what people are already calling a post-COVID world. And when we do, we're going to have some work to do. I got sent a survey this week, which made quite depressing reading, if I'm being honest with you. And I'm going to show you one or two things now. Hopefully you'll be able to see this on the screen. But it said that four in ten neither believe in a God nor in a higher power. 27% said they believed in God. So there's a lot less people in the UK right now that are saying they believe in a God, any God. Amongst British Christians, just over half, 56%, believe in the existence of God. Just over half the people who call themselves Christians believe in God, while 17% believe in a higher power. One in 10 British Christians say they do not believe that there is a God or a higher power. And before we think about the non-Christians in our communities, we might have some questions to answer about what's gone wrong in the church if these statistics are true and part of the explanation might just be down to the question that was asked or people's interpretation about is around what it even means to be a Christian but this year has been the most turbulent year in any of our lifetimes and I think many Christians assumed that as the world was being rocked people would naturally just turn to God, that when we were able to reopen the buildings, we would be flooded with people. We wouldn't have to do anything, none of that evangelistic stuff. We don't have to worry about that anymore because we're going to open the doors and people will just flood in. And it was probably a very naive viewpoint, if we're being honest, because it doesn't reflect actually how ground was ever taken in the Bible. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking ground. It's never that easy. You know, from the very beginning of the creation of earth, there has been a battle raging between the powers of lightness and darkness. And the good news is that we know that from the Bible, every time that Satan is at work, God is also at work. Think about the Christmas story, if you can rewind your minds back that far. The Christmas story we looked at a few weeks ago, Satan was at work through Herod, trying to kill every newborn baby in the attempt to try and kill Jesus. While Satan was out bringing death and destruction, God was at work bringing life and hope through his son, Jesus. And during this year, there's no doubt about it, Satan has been running amok. This virus is demonic. There's no other word for it. But God. How many times have we said that? But God. God has been at work and we have testimonies to be able to, to show that. But during the, the last few weeks, I've been starting to re-watch a program that I, I love called The West Wing. And if you've never seen it before, then it's available on I think, uh, uh, Channel 4's catch-up uh, program at the moment. But I've been really enjoying re-watching it. And I watched an episode the other night when President Bartlett, he visits a small town which has had a tornado or a whirlwind rip right through the center of it. The devastation was absolutely incredible. People were dead. People were homeless. Businesses and homes had been destroyed. There wasn't a part of that town that wasn't affected by the whirlwind that ripped through it. 
And for me, it, it painted a picture of what the virus has done, not only in our nation, but across this world. It has ripped, it has ripped through so much, uprooting things and destroying it in its path. And in that episode, the church in the town had been raising money to build a new church building. And in the middle of the tornado, the church building was ripped down. But the church was still out in force in the form of volunteers providing meals, clothing, and other practical help for the people that were in need. They had their building, their, they had their building taken from them, but in the face of great trial, they were staying relevant to the people around them. And I thought, is this a prophetic picture for the church today? And if you're not familiar with that, uh, that, that term, prophetic, we're going to talk about it and explain a little bit more about what that means over the next uh, two series, uh, two series, the two, two sessions in this series. But in its most simplistic term, prophecy is when God is speaking to us. And it's normally for me when he's giving us direction or correction. And John Thomas on the Streams website, has, or the Facebook page, I think it's on their YouTube channel as well, they've done a great video this week actually talking about prophecy, and actually when prophecy goes wrong, and some stuff around that which is really interesting. But he describes prophecy as this, calling people to God, revealing himself so we can be a witness to God to the ends of the earth. And the reason why I wanted to just explain that, because I want to refer now to a prophetic word that Alison Ross gave Kings back in July of 2017. I hope Alison's watching today, because I hope this will be a real encouragement for you, Alison. And I'm just going to read out what it says. There are people on the streets without hope. They live with constant despair and dread of what each day will bring. There are they are so in tatters emotionally, physically, spiritually, and relationally. They have nothing left. The enemy has stolen from them to such an extent that they are destitute in every area. They need me, as in God opposed to Chris. They need you to set up a way for them, for them to enable them to move forward. They will reject me initially. I think back to the survey. They will reject me initially but they won't reject you. So you can take a step into their lives and then take them on a journey to fullness. You can reclaim what was lost. And more than that, you can enable them to become all that I have called them to be. Will you partner with me in this? Because I have the answers for each and every individual. I will provide all that you need in terms of buildings, equipment, money, people, and I will take you through. And if you're wondering why a word given in 2017 is perhaps relevant today, one of the things you have to understand about prophetic words is something that's spoken there doesn't necessarily mean it's relevant for there. Sometimes it's relevant for over here. So again, just thinking of the Christmas story, because it's easy. Some of the prophetic words around Jesus' birth were spoken a long, long time before he ever was born. So prophecy and prophetic words don't always mean that something's going to happen tomorrow or even that week. Sometimes it's for a little bit further down the road. And at the beginning of the year, I, I really felt prompted to start looking back at some of the prophetic words that we've been given to kings over the years. And I looked at the timing of this one, 2017, and I noted a bit about the buildings. And the reason why that resonated with me, because the first time Dave Saunders ever emailed me about the bike shed project, the building that we have in Grant Street, was the 22nd of June 2017. So he, we started speaking about that formally in June of 2017, and in July 2017, Alison gives us this word. But before we think more about how we're going to stay relevant in a post-COVID world, we do need to think about what is the purpose of the church in the first place. What is the church and what is our purpose? So first of all, we are the people of God. It tells us this in 1 Peter 2.9. It says, but you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are, a ro you are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. Think about that as we go through this morning. Next, we're a family. 
In 1 John 5, 1, it says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves, everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. So we are part of a family the minute that we say yes to Jesus. And according to Google, apparently somebody has counted this, quite how you count all the Christians in the world, I don't know. But let's just trust Google for the moment. They reckon out of 7.5 billion people on the earth, 2.4 billion would describe themselves as Christians. So it's quite a big family when you think about it. Next, we are the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13, it says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up the whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. Now, all these things so far are referring very much to relational connections, aren't they? Think about it. People, family, body. And that's not really a surprise when you think about it because God's plan has always been that we would be in relationship with him and each other. That's always been his purpose for mankind. And God's model for achieving this has always been through family. And you think right back to the very beginning of time, the cavemen, they were in their cave with their family. You know, we see it in the, in, in the very, in, in the Bible, in the very early Israelite communities, what historians refer to as the 3G model. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that the, there was the 12 tribes of Israel. Each tribe was made up into different clans. And within that clans, you had these, what they call 3G families, because it was three generations, hence the 3Gs. So typically, three generations would live together. You might have somewhere between 10 to 30 adults, some, and perhaps as many as 50 to 100 kids. A bit like the Raller commune that exists a little bit further up the road. But So this is bigger than just our natural family. It extends to our much larger family of 2.4 billion people. John Wesley, the, the founder of the Methodist Church, said this, nowhere in the New Testament do you see solitary religion. It was never part of God's plan. Why? Because we need each other. And you know what? It's not just about practical needs. The, it's not just about dropping off a McFlurry to someone's door when they've been self-isolating. It's more than that. It's to spur one another on. And you may be familiar with this, this analogy, if that picture will come up. Maybe not. When you take a lump of coal out of fire that's been glowing, as soon as you remove it from the fire, it starts to, to cool and it starts to go back to its, its black color. The minute you put that lump of coal back into a fire, it starts to glow again. And that's what being part of the church family looks like. When we come away from it, something happens negatively. When we go back into it, something happens positively. It's why in the, the book of Hebrews, we're told not to neglect meeting together. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church, my ecclesia. The ecclesia was a gathering of people. You could only be ecclesia when you were gathered together. You couldn't be ecclesia on your own. And it's why agreed upon times like a Sunday morning are actually quite important. So we all stop at the same time and come together. Even if that's online, it's really important that we do that, that we join together in spirit if we can't, even, if we can't do it physically. But like in the physical body, every part of the church body has a different function. We're all given different assignments by God in order that we can make the biggest impact. But when we come together and work together, that's when some really cool stuff begins to happen. The Bible actually tells us there's a blessing when we work in unity and come together. So a, a really good example from, from Kings recently, you may have seen this in the, in the Inverness Courier a couple of weeks ago. In the run-up to Christmas, we worked alongside the Barn Church, Smithton Free Church, and Clawdon Baptist. And we raised money in order to buy food pampers for local families, local to Smithton, Clawdon area, to help them out over this Christmas period. We raised £5,000, which is a great amount of money. 200 food hampers delivered to people in need in our local community. Nicky Gumball, who is famous for the Alpha course, posted something on social media. He says, I know someone that is willing to match fund any feeding programs that are going on at the moment. So Becky, our goodness project coordinator working between ourselves and the barn, 
was on it like a shot. And she applied and she kept applying and kept asking the questions and we got another £5,000. So Becky then, we had the conversation, well, how, what was the best way to get, um, get help to the people that most need it? And we decided that actually buying vouchers for local shops that allowed them to go and buy food with the vouchers was a good way of doing it. So Becky's been speaking to local Scott Mid shops and it doesn't stop there because Scott Mid find out about the project and they've got money to help do something similar and they've given another £2,400 into the pot. So that initial £5,000 has suddenly become 10400 Think back to Alison's word for a moment. 12400 I beg your pardon, I'm getting shouted out from the back of the room, corrected. 5000 become 12400 Think about Alison's word. I will provide buildings, equipment, money, and people. This is an example of how the church can be relevant at this time when we come together, work together, and there's a blessing that flows from it. So think about what is the purpose of the church and how we stay relevant. The purpose of the church, we point people to God through our actions. And those actions demonstrate God's love and make a difference in the people's lives. You know, and at King's, we articulate that. We have a written purpose. You'd have seen it behind Gareth's head all morning. Our purpose here is to follow Christ and bring others with us. That's how we would summarize that. And how we do that on a day-to-day -day basis, and if you've been around King's for a while, you'll have heard me say these three things before. But first of all, the practical. And we look at ways of meeting needs. And Matthew 5 talks a bit of this when it refers to the term salt and light and in Matthew 5 16 it says in the same way let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father so our good deeds reflecting the heart of God and our job is to point people to God remember those people on the streets that Alison's word referred to without hope that are desperate constant despair these are the people that we need to be being salt and light to. It said, you, as in you, in your situation, in your street, in your neighborhood, you can take a step into their lives and you can take them on a journey to fullness. You can play your part in this by being salt and light wherever it is that you are. Community, by being God's family to those who have no family supernatural by introducing people to the supernatural life-changing power of God and I just want to read out something that Linda put on the comments as Gareth was leading us in worship situations change when we call on the name of Jesus chains are broken despair is broken there's that word despair again refreshing comes the truth sets free there is victory Whatever the situation, there is power as we call on his name. He is mighty to save. There is something supernatural about the power of God. And we need to point people to that in this time. That they might receive healing or be set free from an addiction or whatever their situation may be. The purpose of the church has never changed. It's always been about pointing people to who the Father is. But how that is looked has changed many times throughout history. So for example, in the beginning, it looked like some folks in a garden, very informal. It was just God, Adam and Eve hanging out, very relational. Then it looked like some folks in a tent in a desert, Moses and his mates in a tabernacle. And then it looked like some folks in a temple with Solomon and his mates. Then the Holy Spirit came and it looked like folks scattered everywhere and anywhere. You know, in the New Testament, other than people's homes, the only mention of buildings or God's house in the New Testament is living stones. In 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. So we're back again to that very relational, non-building centered model. History shows us if you've traveled in the UK or even into Europe, you know that the church likes a good building. You've probably been in many city and there's been a big cathedral. I've, I've been in many. I quite like going in and looking around them. I think there's something quite cool about them. I particularly like looking at all the glass in them, the stained glass and how the windows are put together. That really speaks to me. But you know, 
in Alison's words, it mentions building. And buildings aren't bad. We have to be careful of this. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water. If we can use buildings as a tool to meet other people's needs, opposed to our needs, that's a good use of a building. So, for example, you think about starfish. We've been able to open up our building so that local parents with children with additional support needs can find community here. That's a good use of a building. But maybe through this year, God is once again trying to scatter us a little bit further than perhaps we're even comfortable. And I've written a few things down here. What might that look like? And I say might because we're still trying to work through what some of this is. But we have to start thinking about this because we are on the very urge of a post-COVID world. And I refuse to believe that this has all been for nothing. You know, what keeps me awake at night is not the challenges that the virus brings us and still brings us on a daily basis. But what keeps me at night is thinking about what if we miss what God is doing in this season? And what if we slip back into the old ways of just doing stuff? and just doing church. And we miss out on what that he, this whole thing was about. And I think we're off to a good start. And I would encourage you to, to uh, on social media, like the Goodness Facebook page, and you'll start to see some really cool stuff about how we are already being relevant to our local community in a post-COVID world through some of the stuff that Becky is pioneering. I want to finish this morning by reading a couple of things that Carrie Newhoff put online in the last couple of weeks. So Carrie Newhoff, he's a great thinker. He does a lot of stuff around leadership and especially church. And this is just to really to get us to start to think about what church might look like in a post-COVID world. He talks about the majority of people attending church may no longer be in the room. Lots of people connection online as far away as Airdrie perhaps. But we shouldn't be about creating content online to entertain. That's a really important point. We want to connect people to God and to the family. It's always been about connecting to God and connecting with one another. It's still really important that we find ways to meet, even if that's on Zoom, even if it's online. But going forward, perhaps micro gatherings replace larger gatherings. Instead of meeting to gather, we meet to connect. There is a difference there. Inviting people to your home for food on a Sunday morning and watching the live stream. That was going great before we had to stop doing that. But that's something we want to pick up going forward. Gathering to prayer walk on our streets while the service is going on. Perhaps some Sundays there'll be some people online, some people in this building, some people walking the streets of Smithton, Claude and Merkinch and praying over these areas. We're keen to do that as soon as we're allowed to. It's not quite the right time, but that is high on our list to start getting out there in this season. Instead of filling buildings, we look to fulfill the mission. That's ultimately what we want to do. But there's a question in Alison's word, will you partner with me? And over this next week and then in the seventh, we're going to be throwing some more stuff around vision that links into some of the stuff. But that question will remain constant in everything that we look at. Will you partner with me? Thank you, Tim, for taking us through the the kids' words this morning. Um, As you can see, Sarah and I are going to be doing a bit of a double act this morning, getting two for the price of one. And (laughs) normally when uh, Sarah speaks, she starts with a joke. And we actually said uh, last night, we don't have a joke to to begin with. And then we remembered a funny story that um, our daughter Evie had said to us after last Sunday's service. She said, Dad, whatever you do when you're doing these live stream services, don't tilt your head forward. Because everyone can see your big, bald, oval (laughs) head. I didn't realize my head was so oval shaped, but apparently it is not only balding, but oval as well. So thank you to Evie for those encouraging words uh, for last week. As if you see Chris sitting like this. I have to to sit like this now, shoulders back, head up, (laughs) the whole way through this. Um, But today we are looking at part two of our three-part mini-series, looking at how the church can stay relevant in a post-COVID world. And last week we looked at what the church is in the widest sense of the word and its purpose. And the next two, including this week, are very much focusing in 
on what God has said to us and looking at two specific words, one this week and one in two weeks' time, two prophetic words that were given to kings way back at the very beginning of our journey. And we want to start this morning by just taking a little bit of time to look at what is a prophetic word. And I did touch on one or two things last week, but I feel it's important just to go over one or two things this week because I feel that the area of prophecy has had some of its credibility damaged through this pandemic and through this last year. Why would I say that? Quite simply, lots of things that were prophesied were not even close to actually what happened in reality. And the result of that has been lots of questions from lots of people. And last week I referred to a bit of teaching by John Thomas, which was called Why Some Prophetic Words are wrong. And John is a friend of ours personally and a friend of King's. He heads up something called Streams Ministry. And if you want to look up on their YouTube channel, you'll be able to find this teaching. Uh, it's about an hour long and it's absolutely excellent. But in his teaching, he highlights some of the prophetic words that didn't come to pass. Um, and he starts with some that were spoken out in 2019, some well-respected, well-known prophetic voices in the church. And they said that 2020 would be the best year for the church ever. Now, there is a question mark over that one. Maybe history will show us that that was the case, but not in the way that it was presented at the time. So, for example, some of the prophetic words said that the churches would be packed, that people would be lining the streets to get in. Well, that's something that definitely hasn't happened. <laughs> Children's church would explode with kids laying hands on sick people and sick people being healed. And John's quick to point out in his teaching, you may be able to find some examples of this somewhere in the world, but again, not in, in the wide sense that it was, it was prophesied to be. Another one which has been, got quite a lot of publicity, certainly in, in the church news, maybe not the Inverness Courier, but in the church <laughs> news, was a number of high uh, I should use the word high profile, well-respected prophetic voices um, that, that prophesied that Trump would win the American election. And a number of them have in the last few weeks come out and made very public apologies about how they've got that one wrong. And I have to say, I think that was incredibly humble of them and fair play to them for holding their hands up and saying, you know what, we're human and we got some of this stuff wrong. But one of the, the ones that really kind of got to me, and partly because it was one that I was really in faith for, I encouraged other people to be in faith for it as well, was at the beginning of COVID, some prophetic voices came out and said, COVID will be over by Passover. You may have heard that one yourselves. And a good friend of mine who's not a Christian sent me actually a video of a couple of American preachers uh, declaring this. And I remember thinking at the time, this isn't great because he's asking me the question, well, what's happening? I thought you guys said it would be over by now. And I suppose that kind of begs the question, have we seen this explosion in false, pro false prophets over the last 12 months or so? We don't think the answer to that is yes. We think the answer to that is no. A false prophet is someone that would turn somebody away from God. And these guys, um, these, these human guys that have got it very wrong, potentially, and have sort of made amends for that and have apologized for that over the last wee while, are just that, they're human people. And they all definitely were trying to point people towards God. Let's look and see what God is doing in this time. This is where we, where, where we feel God is moving. But they weren't quite right and they did get it wrong. But there's a humanness in that, isn't there? And so... I think it's just really important to remember that when we're thinking about prophecy and we're looking at prophecy, this isn't about fortune telling or horoscopes or looking into the future necessarily. What prophecy is, is about communicating the heart and the mind and the will of God to his people through, um, sometimes through specific other people. Someone who is, we use the term, operating in the office yeah. of the prophet. And one of the things we're going to touch on as we go through this, we all can operate in the prophetic, but there are some people who have a very mm -hmm. specific calling and gifting, and we refer to them as operating in the office of the office, uh, office, <laughs> office, <laughs> office even <laughs> of the of the prophet. And their role really is to clarify, to bring clarity and remind people of the covenant yeah. in which we are living under. And in the past, I've used the term direction and correction. They tell us what we should be doing and pull us back if we're going off course. And so some examples here from the Bible. Um, so Moses, uh, 
referred to all throughout scripture as a great prophet. See, he heard from God. He communicated to the people what he heard about the, the, the covenant that he was, God was bringing the people under. He brought clarity to what they were saying. From time to time, he reminded people of that. And he also held them to account. Hmm. And we see exactly the same with Jesus in the New Testament with the New Covenant. He's bringing clarity about God, what God is saying. He's reminding people and also at times holding people to account. Here, this is what God said we should be doing. Not that, this. Yeah. And so when you hear a prophetic word, when you hear something that you think, yeah, I feel that that's, that's maybe God speaking to, to me or speaking to us, you can ask yourself this. Does this word help people to respond to Jesus? And does it point people towards an increased understanding of who he is, of his heart, and for his heart for his people and for the world? And if, if, you're, if you're hearing that, then you can kind of be fairly assured, yeah, this is, this is probably a, th a thing that I need to take notice of and to look at a little bit more clearly. And so an example maybe of something that's maybe a little bit more dodgy might be, I feel that God is saying to you to not rely on the government at this time, but go out into Tesco's and steal what you need. That's, that's what you should do. And it's an extreme example. You're probably not going not gonna to listen on that. But it goes against what we know the scriptures teaches us, that we shouldn't be stealing. We shouldn't be lying. Um, and so that's why Chris is saying that we use that term, the office of a prophet, because some people do have... Um, special gifting and more anointing in that particular area but what it doesn't mean is that you yourself can't hear from God actually we can all do that we can all hear and respond to what God is saying to us personally for our lives for our families and for our situation because God speaks and he wants to speak to you and he wants to speak to me and so actually maybe what we're hearing is just in this time in this very specific last last 12 months or so Maybe God is requiring more from us about hearing God for ourselves and applying what we've heard first and foremost for us. And I think that's, for me, that's, that's a really important word that I can hear God for myself and you can hear God for yourself too. And I think one of the, one, one of the things about an organization like Streams, the work that John Thomas does and Charity uh, as well and the, some of the stuff that she does in the teaching, it's all about helping people mature mm. in these gifts. You see, because actually yeah. one of the, if you look at the fivefold ministry, the, uh, the prophet being one of them, their purpose is to help build up and mature the church more than actually give words yeah. and that's what the likes of streams and john thomas and, and as a charity as well a lot of what they are involved in doing paul con consistently tells us in the new testament that we should be looking to become mature mm. how many times does he say things like move off the milk and onto solid food using that analogy yeah so it's really important that we don't throw out the baby with the bath water when it comes to prophetic words there's been some, some issues, so let's discount absolutely everything. No, that's, that's not what we should do at all. Yeah. And we need to encourage people actually to still put their faith in the prophetic words that God has actually given us. And so scripture um, explains some of this, and it says in Mark chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honoured everywhere except in his own hometown and amongst his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. I also think that's a really interesting mm. couple of verses because there seems to be a link here between Jesus and the prophetic not being honoured, which then leads to a lack of faith and then that results in a lack of healing and miracles. Mm. And we are determined that we are going to be a church that honours the prophets, especially in their home time. <laughs> Because we want to be a church that is full of faith and yeah. full of expectation that God will do signs and wonders. So the, t the two key words that we're going to look at, the first one today was actually given by a child. And the one in two weeks time some, is from someone who we would describe as operating in the office of the prophet. But this week, uh, you might have noticed the bird table strategically positioned <laughs> behind us this morning. And if you've been around Kings for a long time, you, I would be amazed if you hadn't heard this already. I'm just going to read out actually what's on our, our website. Back in 1988, in the early days of Kings, one of our little girls had a picture of a bird table. She saw little birds feeding on the bird table. Then some big birds came in and pushed the little birds off the table. The little girl 
said she felt God was saying, if we take care of the little birds, the children, God will take care of the rest. And over our time as a church, we have given both children and youth a high priority. We've invested time mm -hmm. and money. This is part of our identity, it's part of our history, and it's also part of our future. So how does this line up with scripture? Well, I believe it confirms a major kingdom principle that was really close to Jesus' heart. That children are important, they model kingdom principles, we need to pay attention to what they say and do as well as actually looking after them. And again, scripture says this, in Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15, you're possibly really familiar with this scripture. It says, one day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. But Jesus said, I love that, but Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and blessed them before he left. That's a well-known verse. I'd be surprised if you haven't heard it uh, before. But Jesus is getting a little bit frustrated with the disciples at this point in time <laughs> because the big birds keep pushing the little birds away. And you can almost see Jesus going, guys, I've already told you about this before. <laughs> yeah. And so, again, Matthew 18, verses 1 to 6 says this. It says, about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. And then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. And so anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it will be better for you to have a large millstone tied round your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. And then a little bit later on in Matthew 18, verses 10, uh, 10 to 14, it says, Beware that you don't look down on these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. If a man has a hundred sheep... And one of those wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out to search for the one that was lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth. He will rejoice over it more than the 99 who didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my heavenly father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. So Jesus is kind of reinforcing the point time and time again mm. that we shouldn't be pushing the little birds away. Now, obviously, he was speaking about physical children here. However, I've always felt in these passages, there's a wider point here. Yeah. You see, the children are representing more than just children. I believe they're symbolic, actually, of spiritual children or, or new believers, people who are new to a faith in Jesus. And they're teaching us a number of kingdom principles. First of all, that we are to accept all people who come to Jesus. If we can't ex accept children who are already part of the family as they are, then what chance do we have mm. of accepting others who don't line up with our expectations? Kids come in here week in, week out when, when we're able to, to meet and they're noisy and they've got the shakers and all the things that Joe was encouraging them to go and get out <laughs> the, the cupboards. And we just accept them because they're children, because that's just where they are in that stage of life. So we can't accept them. How do we expect someone else, an older person, who is just starting their journey of faith? Mm. The other principle he teaches is to, to be childlike. Not childish, but childlike. You know, we should be maturing mm -hmm. as children in the natural are, always growing and developing, but with humble and sincere hearts. And the disciples here, in, in across that uh, two chapters in Matthew 18 and 19, the disciples' focus is actually who is the greatest. That's the context of what's going on there. They're arguing over who is the greatest. They're more concerned about position mm -hmm. and stature, where a child by comparison is weak and dependent. And I think it's from that acknowledgement of acknowledging our weakness and dependence on God is actually when we start to really rely on him more and more 
and that's when we actually start to grow. And I think that's been a big lesson in the last 12 months for us. Our world has been shaken and we've had to learn more and more to rely on God in really uncertain times, mm. which has caused us to grow. There's a, there's a saying, I think you've said it a couple of times when you've spoken about that things don't grow in the mountaintop, they grow in the valley mm. in terms of natural. And it's the same with our kind of spiritual walk as well. So a lot of this is about humility, recognizing like a child needs a parent, mm. we need Jesus. Right. Children recognize at times, sometimes, the things that we don't and we miss. Yeah. And Matthew 21 talks about this as it says, The leading priests and the teachers of religious law saw these wonderful miracles and heard even the children mm. in the temple shouting, Praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant. Mm. And so the children were seeing something at that point that the adults weren't seeing, that the grown-ups were missing. And so, you know, we've talked a lot over these last, last weeks and months about the pandemic and how it's affected lots of different people. But how has it affected our children and our young people? There's some statistics that we just want to share with you. And so an Oxford University study in the first lockdown um, saw 10,000 parents take part um, and answer questions on behalf of their four to 10-year-olds. And they said that... Um, Though that age group had actually suffered um, with mental health issues much more than any other age group. And that year on year, divorce um, statistics are up and actually up just now by around 20%. Um, there was a study from Liverpool Hope University looking at children's ministries. So they did a study on churches and children's ministries during the pandemic. And it was saying that many churches are seeing a reduced engagement um, the longer the pandemic is going on. And it's seen that there are families that potentially had, had minimal faith that were maybe just starting mm. their journey. Um, but actually, it was, it was those, um, that were attend th those families that attended church, that was the primary influence on their children's faith. So those ones that were just starting that journey, church had a huge influence on them and their little ones. Um, it's also um, did some studies around volunteers and volunteer groups and saw that volunteer teams had really been affected and that people were feeling despondent and left disillusioned um, and by the constant changes and the, the frequent restrictions. Um, and actually, as a result, 91% of churches that were asked said that they'd seen a si significant reduction in their volunteer base. Um, and so that's why for us, that comment that, that we talked about right at the very beginning from the lady at Fishes was so encouraging to us. Um, you know, what we're seeing actually with Katrina and her team, with the, with the GOMAD team, is that they, they've got people that are coming in and wanting to be involved. So you may see some new faces popping up over the next, next few weeks, which is really encouraging to us. And just on, on a side note, if you do want to get involved in, in some way, please do get in touch because I'm sure Katrina and her team will be delighted to have you involved in one way or another. School is obviously another area where yeah. kids have been massively affected. And we, we know the reasons why schools are shut and we would agree, as parents, we would agree with the reasons. It's about keeping both the pupils and the staff safe. Um, but there is, the reality of that is that there has been some things that they've missed out on. So I'm thinking about the, the school dances mm. and those, uh, we, we've got some friends who their, their kids were in primary seven and they missed out on that whole leaving primary school experience. So they, they've, they've missed out on stuff. Some other stuff that, that I've been involved in over the years as, as an employer in, in the town is stuff around work experience and being able to do mock interviews with kids. So mm. they, lots of kids have missed out on some of that key things which help prepare them for a world of work when they leave, which is something that they've lost. And on that point, you know, the Becky, our goodness project worker, she's been making it known that they're, she's looking for people to help with stuff around social media, almost like an internship that she's offering at the moment to give people, uh, young people some real experience which hopefully will create some transferable skills that they might be able to put on CVs and into the, uh, going into the kind of workplace. And yeah. remember that we are solitar awards, solitire, solitire. I always say that wrong, solitire. I should know that being Scottish, the Scottish flag award, <laughs> uh, uh, registered so we can actually accredit volunteering hours, so again that's all stuff that's really helpful for CVs, so as parents mm. you might want to think about encouraging your young people to, to think about how they might take advantage of that opportunity, but through my involvement in some of this stuff I was sent a document this week and it was uh, all about the Scottish government's ask to employers at the moment. Now bear in mind, as, as a church, as a charity, 
and a charity with a trading arm. We are an employer amongst many hats that we wear. This is what they're asking of employers right now in Scotland, to support young people and prepare them for the world of work, to help those who need it most, mm. to invest in a skilled workforce, to create jobs and opportunities for young people, to create an inclusive workplace which supports all young people. And as I read that in preparation for this, this speaking this morning, I thought, how well does that link in with some of the passages yeah. and these kingdom principles yeah. that run through every sphere of influence, every area of culture? And the Scottish government's encouraging us to operate in that at the moment, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah. So, what is our response as kings going to be? Well, if you've been around kings at all, you'll know that we are a family. And putting our kids first is a family affair. I feel like you need to sing that little, it's a family affair. I have no idea yeah, about that He's song. no use. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, so it, is, it, it involves everyone. It involves the whole wider family. They're all laughing at me here, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just wanted to take this opportunity just now to share with you a little bit about something that you may have heard of us talk about before, which is something called Growing Young. If you were part of our vision night that we did back in oh, n n November, so, November? Yeah, well, November, it's normally September, but yeah. it was November. Back in November, we talked a little bit about growing young. We were just at the, at the beginning kind of stages of it then. Obviously, things have moved on over the last couple of months. Um, but one of the key principles about growing young is that in order to put the kids first in the thing that we're saying we want to do in our bird table prophecy, we actually need everybody's involvement. We need all the adults to be involved too. And when we say we're about putting the kids first, that is not about us saying to you that you are less important mm. than the little ones. We are all valuable and um, useful and have, have purpose within the kingdom of God. But actually, what it's about saying is that older people within this family have a real role and a part to play when we talk about putting our kids first. Because that's how it works in families, isn't it? You know, there's a real special place in the hearts of the older ones and maybe the grannies and grandpas in a family for the grandchildren and for the children that are part of that family. And that's exactly how it looks in a church. And so I just want to give you a little bit of the history of Growing Young. Again, I did, we did talk about this on the vision night, but there'll be a few people I'm sure that will have missed it. Um, so the history of Growing Young is essentially this, that what, um, what, it, what it began as was a research exercise by an organization called the Fuller Youth Institute, which is a, an institute in America that looks at young people and, and culture and church culture and all that kind of, kind of stuff. And so what they did was they surveyed 250 churches, or thereabouts, who they recognized as all being churches that were growing in size, growing generally, um, but also growing in their numbers of young people. And by young people, what they mean is, is young people ages 15 to 29. So quite a big age group. We nearly fit into it, almost, not quite. Almost, we just almost. missed out. But if you're 28 this morning, you're yeah, young. You're there. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And so in this research, um, there were churches from many different denominations across, across the huge wide spectrum of, of churches um, in, ter in terms of their backgrounds um, and structures. But actually what they found that there was there were similarities within these churches and similarities that these churches deemed really vital for their, their growing and their encouragement of young people and their encouragement of the church in general. And so what the research project did was it identified six key areas that churches who were making positive impact in the area of young people recognized. And so these priorities were this. I'm going to run through them for you, but bear with me because I'll have to keep looking because I can never remember what all six are off the top of my head. So don't the, don't the tell first Tim one, that. No, I won't tell Tim. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> So the first one, and this for me is, is probably one of the most important, yeah. they're all important, but this is a huge one. Number one is that these churches recognized that they needed to take Jesus' message seriously. And so the churches that really understood that the message of Jesus wasn't an optional extra or a side note um, amongst what the rest of everything else that was going on during the week and on a Sunday. But actually what they recognize is the message of Jesus is foundational to everything that they do and that his message runs through all aspects of their church life. And so we have a quote amongst the growing young team and it's this, it's, and we, we actually stole it from one of the ladies on one of the Zooms who said, we always look to see if there's enough Jesus in this. 
And by that, what she was saying was, if there's something new that we want to do and we start it, we ask that question, is there enough Jesus in this? Does this point people to Jesus and who he is and the relationship that he wants with you and I? And so they understand that taking Jesus' message seriously is a huge priority. The second priority was really simple, and it was that they would prioritize young people everywhere. And so by that, what that meant was churches who made young people a priority in every, or every um, sphere in the church, so whether that was um, dealing with the young people, whether that was a coffee shop, whether that was social media, whether that was speaking, whether that was worship, all of the different areas of church that we see, they prioritized young people in terms of looking at them and drawing out the gifting that they saw, a really important priority. And what they saw was when those young people were prioritized, they saw flourishing in all areas of the church, not just amongst the young ones. And the third one, which is a really interesting one, is called keychain leadership. So keychain leadership is this idea that young people, like what I said almost with, with number two, but slightly different, is that young people need to have things called out of them and be given keys, be given the, the sort of the keys to go ahead and run with those things. And so when we call them out, what we see is them grow and develop in areas that maybe they didn't realize they were skilled in or anointed in or gifted in. And so the analogy for this is a little bit like one of driving a car. And so the keys to a car aren't just thrown to a 12-year-old to go ahead and do what he wants on the road. That's not what you do when you're teaching someone to drive. Actually, what you do is you say, you're old enough now, you can come, you can come on board, and I'm going to teach you how to do this. Here's the keys, but I'm going to sit next to you, and I'm going to watch you do it, and I'm going to train you and, and teach you how to drive this car really safely. But equally, nobody learns to drive a car by always sitting in the passenger seat. They have to get behind the wheel sometimes and have a go for themselves. And sometimes that means it's a bit bumpy and a little bit scary for the person that's teaching them, but actually a real privilege to watch somebody grow in a skill. And so keychain leadership is all about that. It's about saying to our young people, we see you, we see you have gifting. Here, come alongside, come alongside us and we're going to train you and we're going to um, help you and encourage you in, in that way. And so number four, is fueling warm relationships. They learned that these churches recognized that relationship was key to the flourishing and the growth and the, um, all, all of that stuff within the church. And as I said earlier, church should behave like a family. It should look like a family with relationships between older people and younger people and everybody in between. And these relationships they don't always just happen naturally. Actually, sometimes they need to be developed and they need to be nurtured and grown and be a bit more intentional perhaps than sometimes we like to be. And when I was thinking about this, I was reminded, you may have seen um, uh, examples of nursery schools being placed inside um, care homes for older people. And these nursery schools were, were placed there um, for, for kind of like a double-edged sword sort of benefit. Um, it's like the older folk had a real influence on the younger ones because they, they, they um, nurtured them and loved them and mentored them um, and, and, and helped them grow. But the little ones equally had a real influence on the older ones because they brought, brought vitality and energy and excitement into a place. And so I wonder if the same can be said for the church. We need each other. Our older people need the younger ones and the younger ones need the older ones. So fueling warm relationships is hugely important. Number five is empathy. How can we have empathy for our young people? And, and the, the research recognized that churches that truly empathized with the issues and the needs of young people today were those that saw growth. And what they did was they made time to listen to what the young people were saying and they acted on what they heard. Really important. And as a result, their young people feel accepted and included within the family. And then finally, number six, got my fingers wrong there, number six, that we should be seeking to be the best neighbors. You maybe have heard of, heard of said this before, that how can we, as a church that wants to be an integral part of our local community um, to the people that live around about us, how can we strive to be the best neighbors to those living and working where we are? And what, again, this research showed was that churches that did that, what they saw was engagement within terms of social justice and community action um, and all that kind of stuff that, that we think that maybe young people are really interested in. 
when churches engaged with that, they saw their young people grow and develop. And I think I just love those, love those priorities and I think that we can really take a huge amount from them as we go forward into the next, next weeks and months. And so what happened was due to our relationship with the Barn Church just across the road, um, we were invited to take part in a cohort of churches that were look, seeking to, um, uh, to develop in these areas and develop in these, these things. And so we were signed up to be part of the training team. I think it's 12 months or so long and we've been learning and um, having our minds blown often by what these guys are saying to us. And so we started off just as a small team, just a handful of us, and we've now expanded. I think there's 13 of us from a wide range of ages. So Duncan is sitting at the back today. Duncan's part of this team, and then we've got some older ones in their sort of 60s and 70s um, that are part of the team as well. And what it's, it's just been so brilliant for us because we are really seeking to grow and develop and learn about the needs of our young people in our church, but also in our community post-COVID. And so what they got us to do was right at the very beginning of, um, of us joining in this cohort, they got us to fill out a questionnaire that sort of got us to answer really, really um, honestly what we thought about the state was in lots and lots of different areas. And so you answer all the questions and it sort of prints you out um, an overall, an overall picture of how we are responding to our young people. And so it was really interesting um, b a bit of research that we did, uh, or the Fuller did, to kind of on behalf of us. And so this is where you come in, because we want you now to fill out that same questionnaire, because we want to broaden that information out so we can get a real good look at what we're doing and how we could seek to improve going forward. And so this is going to come to you at some point in the next couple of weeks, it'll get sent to your inbox. If you're on our mailing list, you'll get a copy of this. Could I really encourage you to yeah. fill that out as honestly as you can? You don't need to hold back it. There isn't anything that you can maybe type in, but you certainly get to put lots of um, feelings about where you think we are. And um, fill it in honestly, because we really want to hear from what you've got to say. And so kind of just sort of finally... I can hear you sitting on your couches, some of you, and you're going, we hear this, we hear that you want to prioritize the young people, and that's great, but what about us oldies? What about us older ones that are sitting here and thinking, where do we fit? I can hear you sitting on your couches and your living rooms and saying this. You know, you are part of the family too, and you're absolutely quite right. You are part of this family. And it's something that was addressed right early on when we started this process with Growing Young, because certainly it was my, um, my question as well about what about everybody else? If we're prioritizing this one group, what happens to everyone else? And so maybe what you're hearing is, we're going to do that, and the rest of everything else is going to get neglected. But actually... That's not, what, that's, not, that's not what happens at all. I'm looking back at the bird table here and that prophecy that was given back to kings in 1988 kind of is the answer because what God's saying is, if you do this thing that I'm wanting you to do in prioritizing the young people, I'm going to take care of the rest. You don't have to worry about everything else. And so growing young echoes this feeling that we've got and this, this prophecy with the bird table really, really clearly that God is in the business of taking care of his church. Yeah. And so what's really interesting is that Growing Young found that the opposite was true, that when we prioritize young people, it isn't that everything else is neglected. It's exactly what that prophecy was saying. It was that everything else actually flourishes as a result. And the churches that were, um, the, that were researched found that they saw growth in all areas of their church when they started to put these principles or when they continued to put these principles into practice. And so going forward... The team I mentioned, like I say, there's 13 of us, a wide range of us. We're going to continue to um, participate in the cohort. Um, it's quite a lot of time and energy, but really, really vital for this going forward. And we're going to seek to look for all the new ways that we can en engage our younger folk, but also engage everybody with engaging with the younger folk. Because we want you to know that our continuing with this, our building with this is not going to stop. So post-COVID... We're absolutely going to continue to build and continue to look for ways to grow and develop. Today we're going to be looking at the last part in a three-part mini-series 
looking at how we can stay relevant in a post-COVID world. And if you remember back to the first week we did this, we looked very much at what is a church and its purpose. The second week when Sarah and I did, did it together, we narrowed it much further down into looking at a prophecy that kings received back in 1988 around a bird table and putting the kids first. And today we're looking at another significant prophetic word that kings received this time in 1998 about being a prototype church full of lots of pioneers. And if you've missed any of them, we're going to edit the different preachers together and put them all online so you can watch them back in a one hour. But the last time we spent quite a lot of time going over what is a prophetic word. And I don't want to spend time kind of repeating what we've already talked about. But we did highlight that it's about hearing from God, which is something that we can all do. And I think the bird table prophecy is a great example because that was given by a child who brought a word to the church. But we also mentioned the term office of the prophet, recognizing that some people do have a special gift and calling in this area. And today's prophetic word that we're going to be looking at comes from a guy called Graham Cook, who is recognized as being operating in the office of the prophet. So one from both ends of the spectrums, if you like. But you know, in a time of in great, in great uncertainty, it's so important to remember the promises that God has spoken over us that never fail. And that's really, I think, at the heart of the song that, that Sarah wrote and, and, and sang this morning, I Forget Not. It's actually the song that we co-wrote together. I'm not sure if I've mentioned that yet, that we actually co-wrote. I've got at least one line in that song. But that's all about not forgetting what it is that God's said to us. Because he is certain in an uncertain world. And it's slightly fitting today that actually we're probably looking at this subject of pioneering because tonight we actually have our elders budget meeting for the year and we're going to be talking about how we can put some of this stuff into action. But I actually emailed, I got Fiona to include this in the staying connected email that went out on Friday, the prophetic word. I'm going to read through it, but hopefully you'll have already read through it ahead of this morning. But as we kind of read through it, perhaps you might want to just close your eyes and let the words sink in. Perhaps as we go through it, there'll be things that jump out that you want to take a note of or even type it in the comments, stuff that God starts to stir up in you. So we're just going to read through it now. It says, so this was Graham speaking to Tom at the time. I sense that what God is calling you to is a prototype church. It's to be a prophetic church. It's to be an Antioch church in the area. It's to be a resource church in this area. You're going to be a prototype church. Tom, that's the first in a series. It's the first in a series of a pioneering bunch of people. And so there's a mantle to take hold of. There's a mantle to be pioneers that means you always pioneer on behalf of other people, never yourself. That means you're trailblazers for what else is going to happen. It means that God does something in you before he does it elsewhere. It means that you bear, that you bear in your body the marks of what God wants to do in this area. It means you'll experience things ahead of time. It means other churches will come into things quicker and easier because you have blazed the trail. There will be a peculiar grace upon the work, a peculiar grace, a peculiar anointing and a blessing and the love of God will be upon you if you give yourself to that. But you are a prototype church, first in a series, first in a series. Many other churches will grow up in the next years because of what God is going to birth in you. But you know it's going to be a painful, it's going to be painful because because you know there's a birthing process, not just for you, but the area, the region. There's a birthing that is going to take place, but you know there's going to be a peculiar sense of the presence of God amongst you. The grace of God will be enormous, but you know, but, but you, know you guys, you've got to strike the ground. You've got to strike the ground. One of the things we touched on in the last few weeks is just because a prophetic word is spoken one day doesn't necessarily mean it all falls into place the next day. But I think we can, if we had time, we could look back historically. I have lots of things that we have done over the years fits in with that prophetic word. But I don't want to spend time this morning looking back the way. I want to 
us to focus our time and actually looking forward and what's next in a post-COVID world. And we're going to be looking mainly at the pioneering bit this morning because I feel that's the bit that God's really laid on my heart. But there's a few things that I do want to just touch on before we get on to that. This concept of being a prototype church, and saying I've talked about this a lot, it reminds very much us of the word that John Thomas gave us about bespoke church planting. And we have discussed at great length, is this God giving us a nudge? Just a wee reminder about what he said to us. You know, church planting in some respects is all the rage at the moment. There's lots of books being written, lots of conferences being held around this subject. And wherever I go, one of the questions that comes up all the time is no one has been able to crack rural church planting. In the cities, you've got models that you can look at and replicate. Not so easy when you're talking about the highlands of Scotland. And Sarah and I certainly believe that a lot of the things that we have learned through this last year in terms of live streaming might just position us to be able to look at that in a different way because every week you'll see in the comments even today you know we're seeing people out with Inverness connecting with us a prophetic church if you know if you've been around Kings for any length of time that you'll know we've got high value on the prophetic and that's quite simple because hearing from God which is what prophecy is really about is actually quite important if we're going to do what he wants us to do The next point about an Antioch church, and we've got a little map there. If you ever wondered where Antioch is, it'd be in north modern day Syria. And you can read about it in Acts 11. And it was in Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. After the church had been scattered, believers started to preach the good news, including in Antioch. And in Acts 11, 21, it says, the power of the Lord was with them. And large numbers of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So this was a place where they experienced great power and great blessing. And many people came to know Jesus. I tell you what, if we're called to be an Antioch church, that should get us excited because that's what an Antioch church involved. It was also a sending church. You know, at this particular time, a famine came right across the whole Roman world. So these new Christians, they were brand new Christians, but they knew enough about the heart and message of Jesus that they were going to send all that they could back to the Christians in Judea who were really struggling. So they were a resource church. And one of the things that we are called to do is to become a resource church. And we see examples of that one a couple of weeks ago with the YWAM example, pictures there on the screen, some families and some people, your money went to help in Africa. As a church, we've always tried to give away what we've had. And just to use a a more recent example locally, we were probably ahead of the curve when it came to live streaming church services. We actually live streamed a part of our service on the 15th of March, so a couple of weeks before the full lockdown came in on the 23rd of March. We just had a sense of where things might be going and we wanted to try a few things out just in case we ended up having to live stream. But one of the things that we've been able to do, and I'm going to say we is in the royal we, we have helped, it's really John, but John has been to a number of different churches to help them in their setup using what we've learned here to go and help them. Because if we can't help other churches at this moment in time, then you question what is the point of all this? Something we've been more than happy to do. But what does pioneering in a post-COVID world actually look like and I've mentioned a a guy called Carrie Newhoff um, a couple of times and if you get the chance to look up any of his material some of it is very good and some of the stuff that I'm going to refer to this morning really sets the tone in terms of pioneering and in one of his articles it's called the five characteristics of churches that are reaching the next generation so thinking growing young a little bit here as well all of the churches I know that are doing a great job with young adults take risks big risks. They're either at odds with their denominations or are launching locations where nowhere else would dare plant a church. And then in another article he's written, eight disruptive church trends. And number eight, spiritual entrepreneurs will thrive. These are hard times for all leaders, but as the dust settles and we emerge into the post-pandemic world, leaders who see opportunities instead of obstacles will thrive. Spiritual entrepreneurs, some people would argue the apostolic fits into that, are the kind of leaders who will find tomorrow's solutions when most leaders can only see today's problems. And I 
I like a lot of the stuff that he's putting out at the moment, but how does it actually work in reality, especially after the year that we've had when lots of people are tired, disillusioned, possibly on the verge of just wanting to give up? How do we pick people up again when it's easier just to slip back in to the way it's always been? How do we avoid that trap of just going back to the same old, same old? And how do we pioneer the new things that God has for us? Because a post-COVID world will need new answers and new solutions for things that we have never had to deal with before. And today is not about giving you a whole long list of here's the things that we're going to do one by one. It's more about getting our hearts and our thinking positioned right so we can do what it says in that word, which is to strike the ground when the moment comes. So what is a pioneer? Looking at the dictionary definition, a person who is among the first to explore or settle in a new country or area. There are risk takers, people who see opportunities, not obstacles, solutions, not problems. And we're going to look at one or two examples as we go through this. Joshua, Peter, and I've got one for myself. But I want to give you another example, if I can, for just a moment, because I was thinking about this this morning, and there was two people that had a huge impact on my faith journey. And this is a couple called Paul and Sheila McLaughlin, or better known as Sarah Singh and Rufy Saunders' grandparents. And they moved up here in the mid to late 70s to pioneer and plant a Pentecostal church at a time when the Highlands probably had never heard that expression. And they did it, and they took great risks in doing it. And Sheila, especially a phenomenal communicator, was preaching in pulpits at a time in the Highlands, in that point of history at time, then that just wasn't quite the, the done thing for a woman to be doing. And they've left a great legacy um, for, for us to kind of follow in the footsteps. And there's other people linked more to Kings, but that was one that came back to me this morning. But some, some examples from the Bible. We're going to look at Joshua first of all. So he literally went somewhere that no one had gone before. And in Joshua 1, 2, and 3, it says, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you'll be on land I have given you. So once God has spoken to Joshua, Joshua then speaks to the people. And it says, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. The Lord your God has given you a place of rest. He has given you this land. So this starts by God speaking to Joshua about what he promised Moses, which is now promising to them. Now Joshua, he listens and he obeys. You know what, part of being a prophetic church is listening and obeying. Joshua tells the people to get ready. He's saying, guys, we've been in this wilderness for long enough. You know what? Break time is over. It's time to move again. Something should resonate with us today. Before reminding them of what God had promised them in the past. And I think as we enter this post-COVID world, it's going to be really important that we are refocusing our attention on the promises of God, which may have been forgotten about, but still apply. That's the whole point of this little series. The next person I want to touch on is Peter. He went to another physical place that he had probably never been before following his trance, a dream, which involved a sheet, an animal, and a picnic. And he goes to visit a guy called Cornelius. In Acts 10, 28, Peter told him, you know it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with him. So Peter was taking a great risk actually by even going to Cornelius' house. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So for Peter, it was actually more than just a physical place he was going for the first time. He was taking ground in a different area of culture, a different sphere of influence, if I can use that language, by bringing the message to the Gentiles for the first time. But again, it starts by God speaking to him. He listens and he obeys. And as we enter this post-COVID world, we need to be confident in the things that we have heard from God for ourselves. And in week two, we talked about lots of some of the, or not lots, but some of the prophetic words that have been given us last year that weren't quite right. And in this season, we've asked ourselves the question, is God requiring more of us 
when it comes to, in, to the area of hearing God for ourselves and to have confidence in what we've heard. And I think that's really, really important because that's what sustains us when the grumbles start. In Peter's experience, so Peter gets a bit of grief for going to Cornelius' house. Acts 11, 2 and 3, it says, But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of, a, of the Gentiles and even ate with them, they said. How often have we been buzzing with excitement about what God has said to us, what God has laid on our hearts, only to come crashing back down to earth with the first negative comment. And I want to give you a little example from my own experience of pioneering this time from a business, work, business perspective, just to give a little different flavor this morning. But in 2008, the construction sector had a really hard time. We we're dealing with the fallout of the banking crash that happened back then. And the effects for the, the construction industry in 2008 were probably way more severe than what we're experiencing with the COVID situation uh, right now. House building stopped overnight. The next couple of years were a battle to survive. Never mind thrive, it was about survive. And then I got invited to a meeting on the 24th of November 2010 that changed things for us. And the, one of our glass suppliers in Dundee at the time asked us to go for a meeting about solar panels. And reluctantly, my dad said, right, okay, well, we'll explore this. Only because we had to travel south that day anyway because Rangers were playing Man United in the Champions League game at Ibrox, which is why I remember the date so clearly. They explained the ridiculous scenario that the government was going to pay you for the next 25 years to create electricity on your own roof that you also then got to use yourself. It was one of these scenarios that just sounded absolutely ridiculously too good to be true. But on this occasion, it actually was true. And if I'm being honest, everybody laughed at us. Solar panels in Inverness, you must be off your head. That will never work. The staff laughed at us. I know competitors laughed at us. And I think in, in one respect, the staff laughing at you was the hardest because at that point we're going, we're trying to do things to keep people employed at this time. But the thing about PV solar panels is they actually work off light, not heat. And you may have noticed that in the north of Scotland, we get more light than any other part of the UK. So actually, this wasn't as daft as it seemed. We moved very, very quickly. Our first advert was actually in the Inverness Courier on the 16th of December. We were doing as much research and learning in the background as fast as we could. And 12 months later, we'd sold a heap of solar panels and all of a sudden nobody was laughing anymore. So what did we learn and how does this relate to Joshua and Peter? First of all, we learned actually not to listen to the doubters and to be confident in the decisions that we had made based on the information that we'd heard. Our confidence in pursuing solar panels was based on the information that we had heard. And our confidence started to breed confidence in those around us. So those who started off laughing realized that we were serious and they started to get on board. And with Joshua, we saw that he was really confident in what he had heard and we can see how it impacted people straight away for him. In Joshua 1.16, they answered Joshua, we will do whatever you command us and we will go wherever you send us. Now, as a church leader, right, you pray for the day that people say that back to you. Just a wee hint there in case you're wondering how to butter up to Sarah and I. Repeat that words back to us now and again. It would be great. Peter also showed real confidence in what he'd heard and the decisions he was making when he was addressing the grumbles. And in Acts 11, 18, it says, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting and began praising God. They said, we can see that God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. Confidence breeds confidence. Negativity breeds negativity. And Carrie Newhoff in another one of his articles makes some points about this. He says, usually no more than 10% of people you lead are opposed to change. We're often sold this lie that when we talk about change, those who are against change are in the minority, but it's not the case. Loud does not equal large. The reason 10% often feels like 50 or 80% is because op opponents tend to be loud. Most people opposed to change do not have a clearly articulated vision of a preferred future. Many of them simply want to, things to go back to the way they used to be. 
And it's the fear of opposition derails more leaders than actual opposition. I think another reason why people got on board was the speed in which people moved. Joshua said to people, we're going in three days. What? Three days we are going. The Holy Spirit said to Peter in Acts 10, 20, get up, go downstairs, go with them without hesitation. And just linking back to our solar panel example, you know, we had our meeting on the 24th of November and the first advert was on the 16th of December. You know, sometimes you have to act before you know the answer to every question. Did Joshua carry out a full risk assessment and full budget proposal before he crossed the Jordan River? I'm not sure he did. Now, we understand that in today's world, some of that stuff is quite important for keeping us out of courts and newspapers. So we have to find a little bit of a balance here. I get that. But how often do we actually lose people and we lose momentum by simply overthinking this stuff? I tell you what, let's just have one more meeting to discuss the thing that we've talked about in the last 10 meetings, just in case. And by the time we're finally ready to move, what happens is we've actually missed the moment. And we get left behind and we miss out. You know, my dad said to me many, many times, you know, it's a family business we've worked in, and my dad's always said to me, the answer's yes, now what's the question? Now at times that can be a slightly risky approach, but let us think back again to what it said a pioneer is. A pioneer is someone who goes first, someone who takes risks, people who see opportunities and not obstacles, solutions, not problems. And thinking back to the story of Joshua and Caleb, 12 spies, 10 doubters, two that said, we can see fruit, not giants. They went into the promised land, they didn't see the giants, they probably did, but they chose not to focus on them, and they said, there's the fruit. That's what God said he is giving us, and that's what we are going after. So what is it, church, Kings and Vernes, what is it that we see God is laying before us? You know, a big part of the, the story was they were the spies, Caleb and Joshua, where they were sent to spy out the land. You were part of this prophetic word. If you call kings home, this wasn't a prophetic word from God just to Tom or God just to the elders. This was a prophetic word from God to the church. So if you call kings home, this is relevant to you today. We weren't part of kings in 1998. It doesn't matter if you were or not. This is relevant to you and I today. So what is it that you are seeing? What is it that you are hearing? Let us know. Start to, to journal, to diary, to email. Help us spy out the land as we look to be relevant in a post-COVID world.